Thank you. Um, I would thank the organizers, but I'm one of them. But <laughs> I would actually thank the other organizers because they've been organizing it way more than I, I was this workshop. So it's really fun to be here. It's a completely different type of um, audience that I usually interact with, which is the whole idea of this workshop. And um, so I've been really interested in learning basically where well, my field is optimization, so I'm really curious about where optimization is being used, and some of you have uh, been clear about it, some of you haven't, but <laughs> um, you know, I'm still seeing basically bits and pieces of it in almost every talk, which is, um, which is really nice, and I'm hoping that you know, more collaborations and interactions, in, um, especially in my, with material sciences, will come out. So the, the, this is about machine learning, this uh, workshop in uh, physics and material sciences, but, um, and for some reason, machine learning has become a way more popular word than optimization, but I would claim that they're you know, almost the same thing, not quite, but uh, so there is, a, of course, a well-defined learning problem, there is a well-defined optimization problem, they're not always the same, but you always use some sort of optimization and learning. Here, I'll talk about a very specific class of optimization problem, which is black box optimization, derivative-free optimization, which is um, very, um, coherent in many ways with um, uh, active learning and with uh, generative models and it's just a different kind of way of, uh, well, more specific, say, say case for um, this type of learning. Right, um, so uh, in the spirit of some of the earlier talks, I'm supposed to convince you not to do something, right? There are several talks that said, do not, so do not use genetic algorithms. <laughs> this, this will be my motto. I actually had, uh, so one of um, my book co-authors, um, Andy Kahn, he passed away a few months ago, and uh, he has this big legacy of having very strong opinions, and he would go berserk if he was here, uh, because he somehow had this absolute hatred of evolutionary strategies and <laughs> genetic algorithms. But I have to say that they, they um, I mean, he, it, he developed that uh, attitude, and many optimizers share the attitude about 20 years ago, and uh, problems have changed since then, and I'll probably refer to this a little bit uh, further. But basically what I um, would like to kind of take a step back and look at what you know, black box optimization is about, and where, uh, what we can do in some sense, and uh, what we can do with um, more, moreover, like theoretically justified methods, and where we probably may need to resort to some randomness, which leads to <coughs> you know, methods that I've been just putting down. Okay, so uh, basically the, the key question is, do you wanna do local optimization or global optimization, right? So everybody wants to do global optimization, but you can't really do that, so you just try your best. And that's one of the reasons one would work on, with Bayesian optimization or evolutionary strategy or genetic algorithms. And I mean, there are probably good reasons, but, but not always it's necessary in the sense that there are cases, like here's a, you know, a function, for example, um, where you know, there are several local and global minima. There are two global minima, there are some local minima. You may or may not want to get stuck in the local minima, but the point is that the surface is not really terrible. I mean, the, the, if you have a lot of very narrow, bad local minima, then it's not clear what you can do. But here, more or less, well, not anywhere you would start, but the many starting points would lead you to a global minima. So it's important to kind of consider that, I mean, depending on what your situation is, uh, and it's been an issue in nonlinear optimization forever. Oops, sorry. So that, that thing aside, that has nothing to do with black box or not black box. It's just, you know, it depends on what the surface looks like. Is it really very um, multi-model or not? Now, if you are decided, okay, local optimization is going to work for me, I'm going to go downhill and I'm going to uh, find a good point, most likely, or you know, I can start with multiple points and find the best, whatever. Uh, then what we typically know in optimization is gradient descent, right? So we, we go downhill. 
So, I mean, many of you do work with uh, some sort of black box optimization, so you probably quite know well what it is, but uh, just in general, I like to contrast the derivative-based with derivative-free optimization like this. So this is a derivative-based. You have a, you're standing on a slope, so this is your slope of a mountain. You want to go down to a valley, you're standing on a slope, it's foggy but you can still feel the ground around you, right? And so you can, you know how to go downhill because you're basically gonna be stepping where you feel the ground is going down. And that's your gradient method. Now, how far you go, it's a whole other story. But um, uh, with, the, with the derivative free method, you instead have um, not a slope of a mountain where you stand, but you have a lake. Right? So the lake may have a bottom that looks like this, and you're trying to find the deepest point in the lake, but all you can do is drop some measurements and find where the bottom is, right? how far, how deep it is. So you have no idea what the surface looks like. You can only take measurements, and these measurements are bound to be noisy. So the <clears throat> sorry, that's the basic premise. So I have only function values, no other information. Um, and uh, that function value may come with some noise, and depending on different situations, you can have stochastic noise, you can have uh, adversarial noise, which is hopefully bounded, because if it's not, you cannot do anything, or, and so on, okay? So that's our you know, premise. So what do you do in this case, basically? Uh, so there are methods, oh, sorry. I, have to give you <laughs> some motivation first. Uh, I mean, I don't probably need to give it to this audience, but um, so the, the more recent uh, motivations uh, in machine learning, uh, there are quite a few. So uh, in machine learning itself, you actually can treat uh, uh, the objective function, the loss function, which is not the, not say smooth, nice logistic loss, but zero one loss um, as a derivative free function because it's not it's not exactly black box. You know what it looks like, but uh, if you're talking about zero one loss, the um, derivative is useless because it's zero everywhere or it's discontinuous. So you have no derivative information from there, and therefore you basically can only treat this function as black box. People usually replace it with some other loss. So that uh, doesn't mean that you should solve it like this, but it's a black box optimization or other derivative-free optimization application. Um, in deep learning, there's been a lot of um, use of uh, derivative-free methods for hyperparameter tuning, right? So we all know that it's an important problem and it's not very clear how to phrase it or how to pose it as a uh, function that you can actually differentiate. I'm not gonna really talk about it. So reinforcement learning, th th this workshop is particularly interested in the reinforcement learning. Um, there are kind of two ways, so I'm talking about policy optimization, and there are kind of two ways of looking at policy optimization. Uh, so there's policy gradients, which is not exactly black box, it's like a gray box, uh, and I won't get into this, but there is a black box um, uh, um, uh, part to it, but also there's been works recently that just treat the whole thing as a simulation process, right? So the um, Monte Carlo simulation tree, I think people call it here. I, uh, but it, basically just averaging a whole bunch of rollouts or making some rollouts and you are you're basically have a black box function to optimize and there's been some derivative free optimization applied to these. I'll mention it um, a bit with relevance to what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> wow. These are always okay. So this is a slide that was given to me my colleague uh, back at Lehigh uh, when I was there, and uh, it's just meant to be for people who understand material <laughs> science. But there's been apparently a lot of um, application of black box optimization um, in material sciences. I haven't worked on these myself, so it's you know um, okay. Right. So what do we do now? What do we do when we have a black box function and we want to optimize it. We can sample, right? So we sample this function. As I said, you drop a measurement of a depth of the lake. So you get some sample measurements. These are your values. And so now I would say that there are two classes of algorithms, basically. There are some that basically would just use these values to make some decisions without actually fitting a model by itself, right? 
So now, what's good about these methods, they're fairly robust, because you can have a measurement that is like extremely high, and, you know, and it's not going to throw you off. Like you're trying to minimize a function, for example, if you get a measurement that is a lot higher than the rest, you're not trying to fit that measurement. You just say, oh, it's too high. I'll ignore that point, right? So they're very robust, these methods, but they're not very efficient because a lot of information is lost. So in derivative-free world, the direct and random search methods are like this. I'll show you in a second. And a lot of um, you know, other methods, basically, are like this as well. And then there's this other class of methods that are model-based methods. They are basically saying, I'm going to fit a model into my data. And then I'm going to optimize that model, and that will tell me you know, what to do next. right? And this is where we basically see it's very relevant to uh, active learning and um, uh, generative models. right? So you, it is machine learning here, essentially. It's just that my data is generated by my algorithm, so I really have to. And, and also my goal is very specific. My goal is not to approximate my function. My goal is to find the minimum. It's a much more specific goal. It makes my life easier. So when I'm approximating, when I'm building models, I have to keep that model in, that the goal in mind. I don't actually care to approximate the function everywhere. I just want to find the minimum. OK, but this is what we will do, right? And I will talk about linear and quadratic models because, well, I'll, we'll talk about it in a second. But ultimately, they don't have to be, OK? So here is a method that so far has been basically, I think, the most efficient when the function values are expensive and when the number of parameters is not very large and when your underlying function has some decent behavior. Maybe noisy, but it may be a noisy version of something reasonably smooth. If you have a completely crazy objective function, I don't know what would work. It, you just can kind of hope for the best. But so this, uh, these methods have been pioneered by um, Michael Powell uh, about 20 plus years ago. And uh, they are not super easy to implement. I mean, this is not something you can write in three lines. You have to work with the code. It, but they're not super hard. And they're, they're really efficient. So they're based on trust region, which is a classical methodology in optimization, not derivative free, just in general optimization. And it works roughly like this. So I, I will build a quadratic, if I can, model, um, local one, of uh, using sample points. So I have some sample points here. I can fit a model into them. It may be quadratic. Well, in this case, in three points, two dimensions, probably it will be linear in the beginning. But um, then I will say that, OK, I only have information locally, right? I, I don't know what the function looks like here. So I'm going to go ahead and put a radius of the trust region radius, right, around the current points where I think my model is good one, OK? And then I'm going to go and minimize this model. So uh, then I will, this will tell me where to go next. I will look at this point. I will decide if it's um, going to give me an improvement of the function or not, regardless whether it gives me an improvement of the function or not. It gives me additional information, right? So now I'm going to have a new model. It's actually even more interesting, because if it gives me an improvement in the function, it's good, because I improved my function. That's my goal. If it doesn't give me an improvement in the function, but the model thought it would, that means it gives me an improvement in the model. Right? So there's automatic self-correcting property, which is really nice, which I think is why these methods work really well. OK, so we can continue this process. I have many slides with this. So it basically just goes on and on and on. And from time to time, when you, you think that you, your radius is too large, you can shrink it because it's important to look more locally. Um, and sometimes you can expand it because you can be more aggressive in exploration because you're be making successful steps and things like that. So what I want to emphasize here is that eventually you have these so, so several things. First of all, I'm doing one evaluation per iteration, just one. So I'm hoping to progress. I may not progress in terms of minimizing the function. But I'm being very, very economical. I'm just trying to one sample per iteration. Now, you can expand it to more, of course. You can, uh, but, but it's, it's trying to be as economical. So this, is, this is for really expensive function evaluation, so one at a time. 
Um, and then and it tries to really explore the curvature. And then you end up with these samples that are not IID samples. They are generated by your algorithms. They don't necessarily have a particular structure. And so this, is, this can cause some trouble, as I'll mention later. OK? And so you continue like this until basically, yeah. But, but the, it exploits curvature, and it's efficient in terms of samples. All right? So just to you know, kind of bring the kind of the point home again. So direct search, which is a method that does not—it's a very dumb method. It just goes north, south, east, west. You know, just tries to kind of uh, collect some information uh, about the function, but not model it um, on this two-dimensional function. Okay, this is a well-known function in optimization community to make slow methods look particularly slow. So of course, it's um, you know, well designed uh, for this particular experiment. But it, it will take 11,000 function evaluations to converge from the point which is 0, 0 to the point which is uh, optimal, which is 0, 1. Just because it's going to be very, very slow. Uh, the randomized version of the same thing is going to do better. So there is some. You reasons to do randomness. If you're basically not exploiting the structure of the problem and you don't know what the structure is, maybe random is better. If you're not learning about the structure of the problem, this is what oops, this is what the trust region method would do. In this case, because it exploits the curvature, it will converge in 69 function evaluations. Right? This is way more efficient. And by converge, I mean converge to a very accurate solution. You can cut it off. You can see that, you know. Basically, very quickly, it gets somewhere very close. OK, so these methods, as I said, they're very effective. There are problems, however. Uh, and yeah, we'll talk about this. So now, uh, as I said, we can use linear and quadratic functions. I'll talk about them. I'll talk about what the difficulties are. and But they don't have to be linear quadratic functions. They can be any. Uh, model of your data that you are care to build, you can probably use a neural network there, right? Instead of a linear quadratic interpolation. The question is, what will it buy you? So this is one has to be careful. Maybe it will be very, very effective, and it will give much better approximation. After all, the more sort of complicated the model, the more the closer approximation you get to the true function. But then you have to deal with that model. So you have to minimize it for one thing. Right? And you have to have enough data for this model to be reasonable. because uh, So you have to have enough. Uh, but you can use past data as you go progress. But if you're using past data, you have to be careful about, because this is not IAD data, you have to be careful about how to um, you use it and not, I mean, maybe you want to bias your model. That's fine. But as long as that bias points you towards the minimum rather than all of a sudden you know, loses all the information. Um, so uh, yes, then so you basically you pick your model. You have some collection of labeled data from the past, from new sampling. You fit a model. It can be anything in principle. Uh, then you minimize this model somehow. You minimize it by itself, or you regularize it, or you put trust region radius around it, or something like this. Is again, you know, what many of the optimization methods would do. Um, and then you you know generate a new step. You Compute one more sample point. You have to modify your model because now you have new information, and you repeat. That's the general process, right? So then the question is, I mean, when does it work? And when optimizers say, when does it work? We want convergence guarantees, right? Uh, now, do we really care about asymptotic convergence or even convergence rates? I mean, to, I would argue, yes, we do, because usually understanding where the theory applies, gives us the correct understanding how the algorithm should work. And specifically, there are many aspects to the algorithm, which I will not cover here, but how to choose the step size, how to choose the radius of sampling if you are sampling more, how to you know, do a variety of things, they all come together in the convergence theory. Okay. Right, so just like a large overview, this, there's a lot of uh, work that has gone into some, some, in some sense, designing these requirements. But the requirements are actually super simple. 
so you either have first order method or a second order method, again, in optimization. Nobody really goes beyond that so far because it gets too expensive. Uh, so a first order method is basically like gradient descent. The second order method is like Newton method, right? I mean, there are two um, types. So uh, gradient descent Newton method require derivatives. This is the same thing without derivatives, but with derivative approximations. So I'm just saying, if I have a model my model and my function should have derivatives that are somehow similar. They don't have to be the same, but they have to be somehow similar. And the similarity is measured by a radius. So their difference should be proportional to this delta k. What is delta k? In trust region methods, it's the radius of trust, the trust region radius. Um, in uh, line search, you don't have delta k. You have this, which is your step size. Essentially, it just says that if I am making steps of a certain length, then this should be telling me how accurate my gradient should be. So as, uh, if I'm taking shorter steps, the gradient should be closer to each other. What does it mean? It means that in the beginning of my optimization process, I can have very crude models because their gradients do not have to agree with the true gradient very well. This number will be large. My steps are large. As I'm getting to a flatter part of the function, I'll start converging. I'll making shorter and shorter steps. I will need this to be more accurate. If I cannot possibly get more accurate information, then I, I just stop there. But that's still pretty good, because it means that I stop when I cannot progress any further. OK, fine. I mean, I don't have enough information to get, to get more improvement. But at least while my steps are large, while I'm making a lot of uh, progress, I don't have to be very accurate. Or other, with some crude models, I can make some progress. That's the idea. If I want second order information, I just need the second order uh, model accuracy, right? This is like trust range, the Taylor series inspection expansion up to second order. So that's more expensive to obtain. That takes um, more samples. And as I said, if you don't want to do trust region method, but you do some you know, standard gradient descent kind of a thing, you just have a little different. But it's very, very similar. Now, the nice thing about this whole theory is that I, this also doesn't have to hold all the time. There is uh, now theory, uh, come on, yes, that we can do all of this uh, analysis where each of these statements just holds with some probability. And uh, and that's important because a lot of uh, methods these days, especially if when you have stochastic approximations or when you have um, uh, you know some gradient uh, schemes that I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, they do not guarantee anything 100% of the time. They just guarantee it with some probability. Okay. All right. So, any questions so far? So now I'm going to actually talk about how do we build these models. By we meaning, meaning the kind of the, the derivative free community. And, and more recently, how some, well, basically different ways of building these models. And I'm talking about, again, linear and quadratic. You can build other ones. There are people who work with RBF models. There are people who work with other ones. You always have to think how much does it cost you to um, basically build your model, how much does it cost you to optimize, and whether it gives you sufficient improvement um, to, to be worth it. OK, so basically, I'm going to talk about interpolation, which is absolutely you know, simplest thing you can do. Uh, but you can think of extensions to regression and uh, many other basically similar models. We even used SVM models, which are SVM regression models, which are you know, basically just for noisy evaluation. So you can do many different things. They all essentially boil down to the same issues, though, whether you can, um, you know, incorporate more information and where, how much does it cost you to um, compute it. So what is an uh, interpolation model? Basically, it's a, it's a, so first, let's start with linear. I want to build a model, which is linear. So the only thing that I don't know is this term here. Well, I may not know the, the um, intercept, but that's easy, right? So in some sense, I, ne I just need, it's a linear model, right? It's a basic linear model. And I have some measurements, and I want to match them exactly. Again, we can do regression. We don't have to 
match them exactly, but it usually we don't have that much data, so it's better to um, you know use it as much as possible to some degree. Um, so uh, we need to solve a system of linear equations. The system of linear equations uh, is basically like this. So this is my unknown. Uh, this is a matrix which consists, so what do I do? Sorry. Um, I start with a set of sample points around my current x. So I have x and I sample some points around it. I may have sampled them at this iterator, or they may have come from some past samples, but they exist, right? So I'm just going to parameterize it by some sigma, so the, the largest, the furthest away point is sigma away, so that's my radius of sampling. And uh, these points, basically these directions, give me a matrix. And I can write the system of linear equations as this. This is the right-hand side, doesn't matter. Then there's a segment there in this matrix. This matrix um, has basically uh, the, the norms of every row is bounded by 1. That's why I'm scaling it by sigma. And then I can solve the system of linear equations, right? And then I can guarantee, ah, come on. Right, and then I can guarantee that this G, which is the gradient of M, is not too different from this F, and that there's a bound here. Okay, so this is important. Now, what's this bound? This L is a Lipschitz constant. It's a constant. N is the dimension. This is the inverse norm of the, oh, the norm of the inverse of my matrix. Uh, this is the radius of sampling. So, if my radius is smaller, this gets better, which is exactly what I wanted. I was saying smaller radius, so Taylor series expansion kind of behavior. Smaller radius, better behavior. Perfect. That's what I want. Um, and then there's this term. So how can I control this term? Uh, that is basically, I'll show you in a, in a minute, but that is, yeah, that's the condition number essentially of this matrix because um, it's bounded by one from above in every row. Now, there's another problem here. Uh, problem is that I have to solve the system of linear equations. Now, for you know many applications uh, that we're talking about here, I don't think it's a big deal. You don't have huge dimension, probably, because of the expensive function evaluations. The solving system of linear equations like this is not really a problem. But in um, reinforcement learning, for example, for robotics and things like that, then especially if you have a very complicated policy, uh, the, the basically number of samples you may need is in thousands. Okay, thousands is still not a big deal to invert a matrix, but you have to invert this matrix, okay? It gets worse when we get to quadratic models, which is in a second. But you have to keep it in mind. You have to invert this matrix. Now, you can do without inverting this matrix if this matrix does not need to be inverted, right? When does it not need to be inverted? When it's orthogonal or even better, identity, right? And there's been work in exactly exploiting this thing. The problem is that what is this matrix? This matrix is basically consists of your samples. These samples you generated through the algorithm. So unless you deliberately generated orthogonal, orthogonal directions, they, it, there's no reason for this matrix to be orthogonal, right? So to generate orthogonal directions, it means you have to basically resample. So every time I'm at a new point, I cannot use past information because there's no reason these, al these vectors are going to be orthogonal to each other. I'm just going to go and sample in orthogonal directions. And this essentially is finite differences just uh, with a sort of larger step size. Um, and that's fine. You may want to use it. Um, but you have to keep in mind that that means more samples. So either more samples or more linear algebra, one of the two. Okay, quadratic interpolation models. Exactly the same thing. You'll end up with systems of linear equations where you're trying to solve for both G and H. So you're trying to build a quadratic model, right? And so you go uh, do this thing. You get a matrix. The problem is now your matrix is just much larger because you, your unknowns are the G, which is N, if N is your dimension, and the elements of the Hessian, which is N, plus N, N times N plus 1 over 2. Right? So you have N square unknowns, you have N square by N square linear system, and so solving it 
could be costing you this much. And that's a little bit bad when you're starting to talk about thousands of dimensions. So in dimension n equals 1,000, uh, it's, you can work on improving that cost. Uh, and the main kind of way to improve some of this cost is that uh, you actually, so this n is the number of samples. It does not have to be n square. It can be anywhere in between n and n square. So any amount basically, is, as long as you have more data than you can fit linear model in, you can use this data to fit quadratic model, but it does not have to be determined quadratic model. And this was actually the reason for success, I think, of all these methods, is that they are able to work with less than uh, fully quadratic models and exploit curvature very successfully. So let's say you have dimension 10, you need 66 points for build, building a quadratic model exactly, but you can have 30 points and do a fantastic job already in terms of approximating your curvature. So um, you can do that, but it's still, it's still expensive linear algebra. You, th these are just the, the, this shows that if you have the right things, you get the right things for the models. So that's fine. Again, anybody who is using models in this derivative-free kind of setting for optimization, I would urge you to build uh, nonlinear models because they're really helpful. But you know, one has to be um, sort of you know careful about the costs. The other thing we have to be careful about is um, so here. This is the matrix. Again, the same thing, except for now this matrix looks more complicated because not only it's the sample directions, but it's also their gram matrix kind of representations. So the inverse, so the condition number of this matrix really matters. And here is uh, like a very basic example uh, of function fitting a model. So there's a set of points, there are six points, you build a quadratic based on that. There are six points there, you build a quadratic, and the, the, the model quality can be very different. And you can see here, the basically, the, you cannot even see the difference between the function and the model. They're very good fit. There, there's a good fit in this direction, which actually translates to this direction here, because you've sampled there. But you have not sampled in this direction, which means that if you are not careful about where your samples are, you may actually get some kind of a bias in the model, which is not a surprise, right, in general. But um, it is, so, and here is an example why it can, how it can happen during an algorithm, essentially. So this is your trust region algorithm where gray is your true function and the blue is the model. And you start with very nice, perfect model that predicts the minimum very well. Uh, you continue moving. I think you first move this way. Then you continue going, and then eventually, you happen to just, all your past points are lined up somehow behind you. And so you have um, a bad situation and your model uh, is really bad, right? What will happen now is it will self-correct. It will say, aha, uh -huh, OK, well, uh, the model was really badly representing the function. So my next point evaluation is going to improve my model. And so it will self-correct. And it actually still works. But um, <clears throat> again, it depends what sort of uh, models you're using. One has to be you know, careful in optimization um, re regarding to that. Ah, oh, come on. Right, OK. So um, some conclusions so far, right? So now we will. So the interpolation models are uh, very careful about using the old points. They are very economical. And you know, in many ways, they're efficient. And you can prove things about them. They converge, they behave well, whatever. You can do a lot of stuff. However, they can lead to very expensive linear algebra. Moreover, the problem is not just the expense, but the linear algebra becomes ill-conditioned. So these systems become ill-conditioned. And if they become ill-conditioned, and we have seen it. So I've worked in this area for quite a few years. And when we were working with problems with like 30, 40, 50, 100 variables, there was no problem. When we went to reinforcement learning applications and started working with things with 1,000 variables, ill conditioning became a really big problem. And you know, there are some kind of explanations why that happened. But so they, the scaling of these methods are a problem because of this. Uh, now, you can instead 
uh, of you reusing old points, design new points uh, every time, sample new points every time. And um, you'll have no problems with ill-conditioned linear algebra. You'll have perfectly well-behaving methods. Uh, but they will be costly in terms of number of samples. So what I'll talk about next are the alternatives that at first glance appear very attractive. And a lot of works recently have been using them. But that we actually at least found an explanation where they're not necessarily better than doing this, than actually still doing interpolation with designed steps. And that's what I'll basically talk about and just explain. OK? So the alternative is Gaussian smoothing. It's become really a popular method, especially in reinforcement learning. There are several papers recently that came out using uh, it's basically so there's a paper I'll talk about it is Nestor of Spakoini uh, that well mostly from Nestor that came out basically um, a few years back that you know analyzed this method in a kind of very simple nice framework and since then it become popular so what does this method do so it's a way to con construct gradient approximations and general approximation of black box functions. It's designed especially for non-smooth functions. So for that, it's yeah, in general fine. But um, so you have a function f, little f, right? That may be not just non-smooth. It may even be discontinuous. It's a noisy function. And instead of computing the function value itself, you replace it with an expected value of this value of this function with, um, you know, with a Gaussian distribution, right, around x. So you take that distribution uh, and you compute th this. So this is how you define your big F at x. And that function is smooth. You can show that it has, you know, nicely uh, Lipschitz continuous gradients, and that depends on, of course, on how large your sigma radius is. The larger sigma, the smoother the function, right? Okay. So the, the especially interesting property is that the gradient of this is simply this thing, OK? So it's 1 over sigma expected value of this times the direction, which means that I can approximate this gradient. I cannot compute this gradient because it's expectation, but I can approximate this gradient by this thingy, OK? Uh, and that's basically an, a sample average approximation. And the cool thing about this here is that remember in interpolation to compute the gradient without you know any I mean so if it's a black box function right I only fun measure function values I had to solve a system of linear equations. Here I don't have to do anything. I just generate some random directions. I uh, compute the function values that I have to still do. So I have to have samples. Um, I have to have this, and then I average them out and just uh, I get the gradient estimate. Yeah. Would that sigma get smaller during the course of the optimization? So that's a very good question. I mean, it kind of depends. Typically, what people do, they don't drive sigma, uh, so they just choose it, right? But yeah, for in the theory that we, like basically for convergence theory, whatever, you have to align sigma with the gradient. Exactly. And, and as a matter of fact, it's pretty much the same. The sigma is pretty much the same that the trust region radius. And as I showed you, like the, the difference in the gradient and the true function has to get smaller as you converge. So therefore, sigma has to get smaller. Yeah, if you, cannot, if you don't drive it small, you stop. Yeah. Do you still use this for a noisy function? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is for noisy function. However, OK, so if the function is noisy, then you cannot drive sigma to 0 because you'll get discontinu well, approximating discontinuous function. So then you have to decide, OK, my sigma cannot be smaller than this. That means that my gradient will never be smaller than this. And this will be my radius of convergence. I will converge to a point where gradient is at something, right? But not 0. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So compare. Uh Okay, right, exactly, right. This is exactly the point. But, but that's, uh, so, so what is n, however? That's a, that's a very interesting point, right? So that's exactly the point. Um, so uh, I mean, it, so trust region is a separate uh, thing. But yeah, the depend, so compared to interpolation, let's put it this way, right? Exactly. I have to evaluate this n times because these have to be Gaussian. 
project, right? And that's exactly is where I'm going with this. So the analysis of Nesterov was for n equal 1. So in principle, you can do this with n equal 1. And that sounds amazing, because you just do one evaluation. Maybe they did two. Well, they did two. Uh, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Because this is actually the wrong form. This is correct as a derivation form. But if you look at this form, now what do we have? This is a stochastic gradient approximation of this. And this is one of the things that plagues optimization uh, these days with machine learning applications, is that well, stochastic gradient is a fantastic method. But the key proper problem, well, not problem, but let's say um, the key thing to notice with it is the variance. right? If the variance is small, it works great. If the variance is large, it doesn't work. You have to reduce the variance. Everybody kind of knows that by now, or everybody working in that field. So this is a stochastic gradient approximation of this. This is the approximation of little f. So essentially, this is the approximation, right? But it's stochastic. What is the variance of this thing? So the variance of this thing by itself goes to infinity when sigma goes to 0. So that's really bad. And it shoots off really fast. But a very small change. Sorry. Yeah, it says there. And very, sm up. Um, a very small change. And now it's actually starting to look quite familiar. What is this? This is essentially finite differences, right? So yeah, I take x, I do finite differences in random directions, sum them up, and I have my gradient. Now, this variance does not go to, zero, or to, to infinity when sigma goes to 0, so that's all good. And so, yes, Nestor uh, analyzed this thing for n equal 1 and showed some convergence, because you have some decent stochastic gradient method. Moreover, the variance of this thing, it's very interesting. It's, uh, so unlike the st stochastic gradient um, in the you know, machine learning sense, uh, the, the variance here actually goes to 0 when the gradient goes to 0. You can show that. The, I'll have some formulas, but I don't have like the whole analysis. But, uh, but that's nice. So when you converge, the variance goes to 0. However, uh, so what, what n should be? What should n really be? I mean, that, that's a question. Um, eh, come on. Right, so there has been some different works. Um, so as I said, Nesterov originally analyzed it with n equal 1. And it's a theoretical method. Then uh, this all of a sudden became popular and was called evolutionary strategies, even though it's not. This algorithm is not evolutionary strategies. In this paper on reinforcement learning, uh, where basically there was not much explanation given, but it was uh, used in a large scale regime in parallel. So this n was quite large. I think it was pretty much the same as the dimension. So you would sample as many sample points as the size of your dimension. And there was no explanation. And then they picked some step size and whatever. And it sort of worked on these uh, Mujoko tasks and whatnot. So that was good. Uh, before that, there was um, some work that didn't quite explain why they were doing it. But they were actually using the smoothing and then using interpolation on top. And these are like some of. These are my friends and colleagues, and I asked, why, why, why were you doing it? And there was like no clear explanation. But now we sort of know the reason. And it's because um, the variance of this computation is um, large. So they were trying to reduce the variance. And, uh, and recently, several more works came out where a similar idea is used. But instead of Gaussian smoothing, they do smoothing on a sphere, which helps with some um, use of um, probabilistic inequalities, such as Bernstein versus Chebyshev. And it helps with some you know, dependence on probability. But it, I, I don't think it's a huge difference in practical form. Okay? So right. So basically, okay, you, can do, you can analyze the variance of that gradient estimate. And this is uh, many different ways of writing it. But from this variance, basically, the analysis, if you, if you want Remember, we want the gradient, the estimate of the gradient and the true gradient to kind of get smaller and smaller with a sample of radius or something like that, right? So we basically, there are two sources of error. There is the error because you approximate g 
the big F is small f, and then if, if there's a gradient of the small f, and then the G is the sample average approximation. So there are two errors, and you want them to kind of to be the same. Um, and then you can work out through these formulas. And long story short is that basically if you want the gradient obtained by smoothing to behave similar to interpolation gradients, to, to gradient obtained by interpolation, you need to sample this much, roughly. Okay? And for interpolation, it's, or finite differences, it's enough to sample n. Right? So it's not better. It's not better in any way. The only way it's better is that it gives the whole spectrum. It, it will still work because it's a stochastic gradient. So it's not going to work as fast. It's certainly going to work much slower. But it will still work with n smaller than this. Interpolation is not clear because, yes, we have this way of reusing old points. But we just said that they maybe give you some ill conditioning. So it is less clear. We have no clear answer for that yet. Can we work? I mean, yes, in many applications, we can work with less than um, n points per iteration. But uh, it is, yeah, how like th there the, the, you know, the theory and practice are becoming a little bit more vague. But if you want this, them to behave, you know, basically, if you, if you can afford to sample n, there's no point in sampling 3n, just sample n and do interpolation. And here are just some examples on, I think, uh, yeah, we just generated some, you know, nice smooth function. And with control of Lipschitz constants of like Hessian and whatever. So this is, um, and we did a whole bunch of experiments basically to show that uh, indeed in practice the gradients obtained by Gaussian smoothing are hard to so to drive them to to be more and more accurate. You have to sample more and more. Whereas with interpolation or think about it as finite differences, you don't need to sample more. You just need to sample closer. If you don't have noise, you just sample closer, they get more accurate. There's no question about it. But with Gaussian smoothing, you have to sample more and more. So these are basically for different dimensions. Uh, on the right here are the different smoothing methods. This is Gaussian smoothing. There's a version centralized, like central finite differences Gaussian smoothing that some people use in papers, smoothing on a ball, centralized smoothing on a ball. Uh, finite differences, centralized finite differences, and just interpolation. And um, this is kind of the point below which you want to be for any kind of accuracy of the gradient. It's a relative error in the gradient, so you really want it to uh, log of the. It's a log of the relative error of the gradient, so it has to be below zero. Otherwise, you're you know you you're making more error than the size of your gradients. And so this is basically various. So techniques show the various settings showing that um, the theory, like the, the, the derivation of the theory that I had, exactly coincides with practice. Uh, so then you can compare the algorithms based on uh, these methods. And this is a kind of a fairly known, well-known Maury Wild set for uh, derivative-free optimization. There are different noisy problems. Blah, blah, blah. And so the trust region methods that does one sample at a time is performing quite well. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the finite difference methods, or like interpolation, when you sample a bunch of points at a time, are also doing quite well. And they're more stable. Um, and I don't know if you uh, are very familiar in this community with these performance profiles. But basically, the idea is that the algorithms that go up faster and get to the top are better. Um, and so the, the algorithms based on Gaussian smoothing are not so great. Um, I want to mention here, this is important for practice, that um, when you, so I talk a lot about gradients. And in the beginning, I said, well, we want nonlinear functions. We want nonlinear approximations. So in trust region, we build quadratic approximations using uh, basically interpolation. There is another way of building quadratic approximations, and that is through the well-known quasi-Newton methods. If you have gradients, you can accumulate them, and you can build quasi-Newton uh, approximation of your objective function, and those are well-known to work really well. 
in many, many um, optimization problems. The problem with them is that they don't work well with inexact gradients. So if you have inexact stochastic gradient with a lot of variance, they do not work well. So there's a lot of people in the community trying to work on those, and they don't. And so here, the example that from, from interpolation, you can get accurate gradients, and then you can do this, whereas from Gaussian smoothing, you cannot. Oops. Um, OK, and the final um, thing here is we've tried so this was without the, the trust region method because it was a little bit too complicated. It's a colleague of ours in, um, uh, in Google uh, tried it on different Mojoko tasks. So this is uh, interpolation. Uh, this is finite differences. Uh, this is uh, Gaussian smoothing. This is with line search. And to be honest, these Mojoko tasks are actually not probably a very good benchmark. Uh, because the, the surface is all kind of weird. I think they're flat in some areas, and there's a big jump. They're flat again. Um, so what I want to say here is that um, so he, he had these experiments before as well. And he said, OK, fine, the differences work terribly. They just don't work. Because uh, look, right? So it's like the, the, these um, algorithms all kind of get to the top, more or less. Gaussian smoothing, not as well as the others. But the finite differences is much worse. Why is finite difference is much worse? Well, it turns out that it does get stuck because there's a flat area, right? And I've heard, you know, in some of the talks, that's an issue, right? It, 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 your optimization algorithms can get stuck. This is where randomness helps. But you can do randomness in different ways. So all we did is, like, as soon as it gets stuck, you just perturb the, uh, you know, the sampling stencil. So instead of, you know, going in one orthogonal direction, you go in the different orthogonal directions, and then it will immediately disappear, that problem. So when you use randomized uh, parts of the algorithms, it, it, it can help you to get out of these flat areas where a deterministic algorithm will get stuck. But it doesn't mean you should be using it excessively or all the time. It just you need to kind of think about why you're using randomization. Um, rather than just a fully deterministic algorithm, because they will make fewer. I mean, if it's a deterministic algorithm is progressing, it is more economical than the randomized algorithm, because randomized algorithm does random things, right? But um, but sometimes you do need randomization. There's no question about it. Okay, and basically that's the conclusion. And there are several papers that you can read upon it, and maybe some others if you want. And I'll be happy to talk about these things with any of you. Thank you.